Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and guess what? I'm going to read more of our book, Poison Power, by Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin. And uh, again, apologies for being gone for a week, but I uh, dropped my laptop uh, on the way home from Louisiana, and it wasn't until today when I called the company that's going to fix it that the lady showed me how to make it work. So... Here I am on my laptop. I'm going to read a little bit. I've got to figure something out for the two weeks. It's going to be gone for two weeks when I get this sent off. But they'll fix it, and then we'll be back to normal. So it might be a little bit dodgy in the next two weeks. But anyways, here we are. Chapter 11. Woohoo! We're getting through this book. Must we hold out for the, quote, cold corpses? Unquote. Really? The cold corpses? So that's chapter 11. Wow, page 243. Proponents of nuclear electricity and other atomic energy developments are quick to claim that, quote, we understand radiation hazards better than any other environmental pollution hazard, unquote. Another favorite, quote, we have proceeded with more consideration of safety in atomic energy than in any other industry, unquote. Mm. I, this is where it's hard for me not to cuss. One yardstick used by these atomic energy enthusiasts is the heavy expenditure of public money in studying radiation hazards. A great deal of money has certainly been spent, much of it unwisely and inappropriately. As for the methods used to establish safe radiation standards for atomic energy development, less sound public health principles would be hard to imagine. Here is what we foresee in, in public health losses if atomic energy programs, including electric nuclear electricity, are allowed to proceed under our current allowable exposure standards, an average of 0.17 rad per year for Americans. And actually, that has actually been seriously increased since... Um, Fukushima, we're super screwed. Uh, cancer plus leukemia, new subtitle. 10% increase in the annual cancer plus leukemia death rate. One extra cancer for every 10 occurring now in the entire U.S. for 200 million people. This would mean 32,000 extra cancers plus leukemia deaths every year, exclamation point. Uh, but I think we've moved beyond that, Mr. Dr. Goffman. People don't care if they die of cancer. Genetic diseases. 5% to 50% increase in the rate of genetic changes. For 200 million people, this ultimately means 100,000 to 1 million extra deaths per year from various genetic diseases, particularly heart attacks. If our population should ultimately grow to 300 million, and we're twice that now, the genetic death toll would be 150,000 to 1,500,000 per year, not counting a 5% to 50% increase in the incidence of socially crippling diseases such as diabetes, schizophrenia, and rheumatoid arthritis. So essentially he's telling us that it not only causes diabetes, but schizophrenia and rheumatoid arthritis. Huh. Contemplate a 50% increase in the major mental disease, schizophrenia. Mental patients already occupy one half of all hospital beds in the U.S. All of these staggering projections in health costs are already accepted by numerous leading scientists worldwide. Some project precise cancer or leukemia figures at half as high, but others say it will be three times as high. But the precise number is not the issue. The horrible realization that the truth does not lie in the tens of thousands of deaths an annually, but the one case or none the Atomic Energy Commission suggests to the public. Wow. And though the projected genetic deaths are uncertain between the huge number of 100,000 and 1 million per year, we are certain the genetic cost will be staggering. Go ask Don. Go ask Don Chapman, who has three children who were born with genetic birth defects. 
She's never described what they were, but she's the spokeswoman for Just Moms STL St. Louis. They're trying to get remediation of the nuclear dump site that they live right next to, less than two miles away. Don Chapman lives less than two miles away. All three of her children are affected. Back to the book. Surely some major flaw in logic characterized the entire approach to setting radiation standards if in the 25th year of the atomic era we find that the safe or allowable doses are so lethal. Actually, total illogic is the base characteristic of radiation standards development for the workers in atomic plants and for the population at large. And elementary reasoning shows us that if we proceed to handle environmental poisons in the future the way we have handled the radioactivity problem up to now. Our environment and our species are surely doomed. This is why we're fighting back now. Perhaps the simplest way to understand the erroneous approaches of the past is to ask how we might act if the problem were a new one. Suppose we have just developed a new wondrous technology with a byproduct poison. For purposes of generalization, let us call this poison Q. How much escaping Q would we be willing to tolerate in the environment where it might affect millions if hundreds of millions of humans? Of course, we must be concerned not only about whether the people would drop dead immediately from exposure to Q, but also about possible long-range effects upon individuals and the entire human species. Cancer and leukemia cases might generally result in 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25 years later must worry us. Genetic damage that might take generations to show up had certainly better worry us. The promoters of the new technology would surely tell us in two-page ads in all national magazines that life on Earth would be miserable unless the technology were immediately spread throughout the land. These same agents would probably wish to spend as little money as possible on protecting the people from exposure to Q. Therefore, they would want minimal regulations against releasing Q into the environment. How should, society, how should society decide on the amount of Q that would be allowed to reach humans? Elementary logic would dictate that the promoters of the technology must prove safety of releasing any Q to the environment that Q can do no harm to humans before they can release any Q. This is a side note. If any of you guys are uh, Star, Star Trek fans like me, isn't it weird that they picked Q as their character that comes back and forth, the omni omnipotent power, that they use the word, the letter Q, just like in this book, Q, which stands for nuclear radiation? God, we're just so fucking gaslit, I swear. Okay, back to the book. And how did we actually manage the question of radioactivity? The promoters of atomic energy in the body setting the standards said, in effect, the public must prove it is being harmed by radioactivity before it will stop radioactive pollution. That's what's happening in St. Louis. Where environmental poisons are concerned, it has always been up to the public to show harm rather than up to the polluter to prove safety. Should society say with excellent reasons that no cue should be released into the environment until its safety is established, it is certain to be faced with two of atomic energy's favorite cliches. Do you want to stop technological progress? Do you realize the benefits outweigh the risks? of which F-bombs start flying out of my mouth. Back to the book. Society answers, of course we wish to receive all the benefits technological progress can give us, but we insist on knowing the hazards involved. After all, we are the potential victims. You must convince us that we stand to gain, that what we stand to gain is greater than what we stand to lose. And if there is a risk, Prove to us that we cannot receive the same benefits through some less hazardous means. 
If the proponents of the Q technology follow the pattern of the atomic energy promoters, they will answer us, we, know, we just know the benefits are marvelous. The benefits just must outweigh the hazards. And furthermore, we have seen no evidence that the amount of Q we plan to release will cause cancer, leukemia, and genetic damage to humans. But you are not saying that Q has been proved safe, the public responds. Your statement of no effects observed simply reflect your ignorance concerning Q. If you have made inadequate observations with Q or none at all, how can you possibly know the answers? In answer, the Q promoters will be expected to appoint a body of expert scientists who will hold a long, serious conference and emerge from it with a magic number plucked out of thin air with a permissible standard for the safe release of Q. And the public will be told it needs to have no fear that the expert standard setters will be watching the situation carefully. If too many corpses appear, they will confer once more and then set the safe standards for Q lower. The public will certainly denounce the plan. What utter nonsense it is to release the poison Q into the environment and wait to see what happens. Surely there must be a more rational, a more rational approach. The Q technologists promote, propose next that they be permitted to release Q in some amount. Presumably, some accidental exposure will occur to sizable groups of humans. The experts plan careful studies of how many cancers, leukemias, and genetic mutations are occurring in the exposed humans. Then we will know precisely how bad a poison Q is. If the number should prove to be too high, we'll reduce the permissible levels of Q. This is precisely what happened with atomic energy. The standard setters waited for the corpses to appear in Hiroshima survivors before they would believe increased cancers occur in humans exposed to radiation. These, oh my gosh, I don't know how people go their lives without cussing. I swear, I really don't. Meanwhile, of course, all 200 million people in the country might have been irreversibly injured by the Q already released, and that is where we are today, folks. Obviously, disaster is the fate of people willing to accept a poison in their environment, hoping that an accident will show them how dangerous the poison is. Worse yet, they will come to realize that technology spawns many Q poisons, not one, and all of them together might mean the end of life for the human species. This entire scenario about the new poison Q may sound far-fetched. Not to us in 2015, almost 2016. But it is, precise, it is a precise description of how the radiation hazards question has been handled in the course of developing atomic energy. Far worse, both the nuclear electricity promoters and the standard setting bodies will insist vehemently that they must be allowed to proceed with the same idiocy into the future. Atomic energy technology was pushed hard by two governmental agencies, the AEC and the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Accredited biological experts were assembled in one committee or another to consider radiation and radioactivity and decide how much people could be exposed to. Obviously, the pressure was on. These expert bodies must burden the atomic technology with the fewest possible restrictions. Did these experts tell the technologists the burden of proof of safety is upon you? Did they say, we refuse to allow you to expose anyone to man-made radiation because we don't know how much physical damage it will cause? No, they did not. Instead, they pulled some numbers out of the hat and declared that the numbers represent, quote, acceptable, unquote, standards for human radiation tolerances. And the atomic technology proceeded under the blanket of respectability of these allowable doses. 
So the phone's going to ring a total of six times, you guys. So I'm just going to keep reading. By now it is obvious, since these acceptable doses have had to be lowered 100-fold in the past two decades, they have... Okay, I'm going to start this sentence again. By now it is obvious that these acceptable doses have had to be lowered a hundredfold in the past two decades, and they have something certainly, and, and gosh, it's a confusing sentence, and they have something certainly was wrong with the original standards. Not only did they, that's not only been lowered a hundred times, it's been increased since Fukushima by, what, thousands of times. Perhaps the experts did know that people wouldn't drop dead immediately from the acceptable doses they said at first. But for such late effects as leukemia, cancer, and genetic diseases, the experts could hardly have been further off base than they were. If there had been no information available to the so-called experts, about the potential danger of cancer and genetic injury in humans, it might be argued that the men who set the standards had no way of knowing such radiation effects were possible. But the knowledge was available. The scientists knew that radiation causes cancer and genetic damage, and still they set totally unacceptable standards. It is impossible to believe anything but that the agencies responded to the pressures from the atomic technology promotion, promoters for standards we can live with. The technologists were presented with a set of numbers for human exposure that presumably wouldn't make the promoters too unhappy, while those who set them probably prayed the disaster to the human species wouldn't be too severe. Oh my God, I'm going to stop here. We're on page 250. At the very bottom, it starts, the essence of this prayer comes through the very forthright statement of ignorance. Wow. You know, honestly, it's been about a week since I've cussed. Seriously bad. And it's been about a week since I read this book. <laughs> I think the two go hand in hand. Uh, man, this thing speaks for itself, you guys. We've been super screwed. Time for us to stand up, put our courage feet on, and stick up for humanity, man. Put your courage feet on. Demand peace. Demand the truth. And, you know, refuse to be a coward. That's the key. Just refuse to be a coward. Be happy. Put your courage feet on. Do whatever you think you can do to make a difference because they literally are killing us and they've known it. So, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. See if I can make this work. <laughs> Bye.